Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be back. It's actually been um, almost a year to the day since I was last up here fighting for my life. And um, when I was last up here, we, I spoke on Daniel and the lion's den, and it, and it really produced some amazing productivity if you think about the last year. I mean, we've got a new youth pastor in place. We've got uh, a worship pastor starting uh, next month, I believe. We've got a, a finished parking lot. So I'm excited to see what God does with my sermon on Moses this morning, so <laughs> I'm kidding. But on behalf of the elders, we really, really are excited about uh, just the direction that God is taking us and, and what God has in store for the chapel and, and specifically southeastern Connecticut. So continue to pray with us. Um, I think there's a picture of my family here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there we go. So uh, for those of you who don't know me or my family, that's Jenny, my wife, uh, my son Ethan and my daughter Riley and, and our two dogs that occasionally we torture by, by dressing up in ridiculous little costumes like that. Um, it only lasts for about five, set, five minutes because you can see the utter shame in their eyes right there. They're like, please take this off. But um, anyway, that's my family. Um, we're continuing to work through our summer series in Hebrews chapter 11, looking at examples of godly, faithful men and women. Most recently, we've looked at Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And now we come to Moses. Moses is iconic in the Jewish culture. Moses and Abraham, to both the converted Christian Jews and to the early church, played a huge part in understanding and being able to relate to God. They saw through Moses' life deliverance and the imparting of the law and something about the character of God. And then they saw through Abraham a faith that bore an entire civilization, a miraculous civilization, um, Israel, a miracle coming through uh, a baby of Sarah and Abraham at very old ages. And so the early church, while striving to understand God's fulfillment of promises in Christ, is still wrestling with this need to finish, to, uh, the need to add to the finished work of Christ both practices and traditions that are actually detracting or taking away from the power of Christ's teaching, his death, burial, and resurrection. So the author of Hebrews is systematically picking apart chapter by chapter explaining how all these icons of the Jewish faith pointed to something much bigger. And the relevancy of the book of Hebrews can't be understated in our lives. Another picture here, while driving through New London one night, my daughter and I, I don't know if you can see this very well, we pulled up behind this vehicle and there's a number of varying stickers littered on the back of this car, as you can see. And the one that stuck out, the ones that stuck out to us being the Jesus fish and, and the cross. Um, and I put this up not to judge the other stickers, but giving benefit of the doubt of the fish and cross stickers that this person might at least have some knowledge of the gospel, I had to ask myself, isn't this what the author of Hebrews is dealing with in the church? This marketplace of ideas and contradicting beliefs in the culture. Are we influencing the culture with the gospel message or is the gospel message influenced by the culture? Do we bring Jesus into our lives to transform us into his likeness or are we just adding him into the mix along with everything else? The Jesus I read in the Bible wants to be the transformative, life-altering agent in our lives. He fulfills and changes us unlike anything else. And so we see this in the lives of ordinary people sold out completely to their God in Hebrews chapter 11. So the, the message of the book of Hebrews to the church is let's get focused. I like the way one Christian author puts it. He says there are many ways of looking at Jesus. Good man, historical character, interesting teacher, one who sees, one who hears, one who loves. At any point, we could easily walk away feeling like we've seen everything we need to see, when in fact, we may have seen very little. The risk of looking again may well change everything. The risk of looking again may well change everything. And the author of Hebrews is doing just this. He's challenging the church to go back and look at Jesus again. 
So we arrive at chapter 11 in Hebrews and find numerous examples of the Jewish history of God's people participating in and being obedient to their faith in God. To these believers, faith was more than ideas about God. It was a reality. The object of their faith was the God who is truth, capital T. So let's follow along as we read today's passage. Hebrews 11, 23 through 29. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By surveying the life of Moses, the author of Hebrews wants to connect his audience to some key faith lessons in the life of this patriarch. His survey includes, as we read through the verse, at a very high level but critical points in the life of Moses. Much could be said about the life of Moses if you go back and read Exodus. But the, the author chooses to talk about his faithful parents, Moses' faithful choices, his faith in the future, his faithful following of God's commands, and ultimately deliverance by his faithful God. The life of Moses in these five faith lessons is a near perfect analogy to what the author of Hebrews is trying to convey back in chapter 10. It's kind of an eye chart, I'm not sure if you can see this, but if you take a look at the slide, you'll note the way chapter 10, 32 through 39 really connects us to this morning's passage in Hebrews chapter 11. He says, remember to stand your ground like Moses' parents. Remember your faithful choices will be honored like Moses' were. Remember, we serve a God that's all about the future and fulfilling his promises, just like Moses did. Remember, you serve a God that will save you, just like Moses. Remember, our God is a God of deliverance. We saw this in the life of Moses. And then he, in, he, in, he uh, ends Hebrews chapter 10 with some really powerful verses. He who is coming will not delay, but my righteous ones will live by faith. And then he says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. So I want to connect these five points in the life of Moses with these five remembrances in Hebrews chapter 10 to better understand what this victorious faith looks like. Faithful parents. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. So some important points here. We see parental wisdom, we see parental foresight, and we see parental fearlessness. A victorious faith begins through victorious families. Families where there's a priority in building and nurturing the faith of your children. So many parents will say, you know, there's just no handbook when it comes to raising kids. Have you heard people say that? Um, but we in the church should have an answer for that, specifically to each other in the church body. But outside of the church, we do. We have God's word. And specifically in God's word, we have, Hebrew, we have Proverbs chapter 1. Look, look at this for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing as what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. In other words, there's something here for everyone. There's something here for everyone. And then it's all grounded in this command. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. That's the cornerstone. Wisdom comes to us the same way that we pass it along through our kids, to our kids, through the fear of the Lord. Our actions as parents and the way we train our children is directly tied to our faith. But we see Moses' parents also showed parental foresight. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, if, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Timothy is correlating the physical needs of the family and the spiritual needs of the family. If you walk out on the physical needs of your family, you're walking out on their spiritual needs. 
Parental foresight is understanding the needs of your family and meeting those spiritually and physically. And I'm not talking about materialism. I'm not talking about making sure your kid has the latest, greatest pair of Nikes. It's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about meeting your needs, the needs of your family spiritually and physically. The last point, the parents acted in fearlessness. They chose to go against the edict of the king, as we read in Exodus 2.24, and God protected them. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. We step out in faith, doing the right thing, knowing that God hears, remembers, and is concerned. And as the story goes, because of the parents' faithfulness in following God, they were able to stay a part of Moses' childhood. Look back to Exodus chapter 2, and we out, it outlines the way God brought the mother and the sister back into Moses' life through his childhood. We see these foundations then play out in the next part this morning of, of Moses' faithful choices. Hebrews eleven twenty four through 26, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So we see Moses had this growing faith. We see he had a refusal to turn from that faith and he was willing to suffer for that faith. By faith, when Moses had grown up, the faith imparted to him clearly developed in him and directed his choices. It was more than just tradition that Moses observed in his family, even with the heavy influences of the culture on his young life. A survey done in 2004 by George Barna, who does a lot of surveys of, of the church culture, typically they're very negative, but uh, George Barna found that half of our young people, ages 8 to 12, about 46%, stated that their religious faith was very important in their lives, meaning there's another half that didn't think it was very important. Most of them responding to the survey stating it didn't matter what religious faith they followed because they all taught the same lesson. Moses was raised with entitlement, with all the best schooling, everything he could want from the world, but for Moses, his faith was about truth, and that was picked up through his family. And that would result in viewing his life in a long term and not in a short term. Parents, if you think your battle against the culture of our time is tough, take a look at the parents of Moses. Take a look at the culture Moses was raised in. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where Moses' knowledge began. But we move on to our third point, faithful suffering. Taking a stand in your faith often requires extremely difficult cultural choices, requiring us to separate even from long-standing traditions or social or economic positions of power, again, Hebrews 10.32 said, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. There are multiple testimonies that we can read of Muslims or Mormons converting to Christianity and most of them ending in separation from family or from wealth or positions of status. And I don't say any of this lightly because it's only the reality of God's presence and the work of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life that someone can, can consider the line that Moses said, disgrace for the sake of Christ is of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. As Moses, as Moses did, God's faithful followers who have seen the truth in Jesus have said what David said with boldness in Psalm 84.10, better is one day in your courts, finish it. Amen. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. David said, in essence, I'd rather be the doorman in the building but be with God than in the penthouse suite with evil. And so that's just what Moses is doing. That's the position he's taking. But finally, more than all of this, was not Jesus himself rejected from his own. John 1.10, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. What is it that you're afraid to leave for the sake of Christ? God wants to give us victories over our fear. He wants us to find pasture and fulfillment in him. What is it you need to turn over or give back to God 
because you're holding on in fear. And if you're new this morning, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. The rest of you, you might have been placing bets as to how long it would take before that happened. I'm clocking about 10 minutes here, so. I don't know if I made the spread. Just kidding. Um, we move on to, to the faithful future Moses saw, Hebrews 11:27. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So Moses walked towards God, or in this verse we actually see he ran. He persevered, and he understood the nature of faith, trusting the invisible. So it says Moses fled to Egypt, and it wasn't because he was afraid of the king. When you go back and reread the life of Moses in Exodus, we see Moses fled Egypt because he was in danger of the Pharaoh, from the Pharaoh. But what the author of Hebrews wants to make clear here is that it wasn't the king that he truly feared. It was the fact that he attempted to do God's work on his own instead of in God's way. In fact, the verse says, he did not fear the king, dot, 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 but him who is invisible. He had to get away. If you recall the story in Exodus 2, 11 through 12, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way, glancing that way, saying no one. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. After this, he was found out and had to flee for his life. But the author of Hebrews wants to make crystal, wants to make crystal clear that the readers understand it's because he had to reckon with God. That was his true source of fear. Alone, Moses goes out in the desert to do just this, to hear how God actually wanted the plan to work out. And he per persevered in the desert for 40 years, 40 years before God would use him for his purposes. How often in our faith do we do this? Do we get out in front of God's plans? Do we try to gain our own victory over the flesh rather than allowing for God's timing in our lives? Do we do this in our finances? God, I'm going to buy this on credit because I think you want me to have it. Do we do it in relationships? I'm going to engage in this unhealthy relationship because I just don't want to be alone. God will grant us faithful victory in all areas of our lives if we pursue his timing rather than our own. Get alone with God like Moses did. Faith must persevere. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Moses was certainly human and full of fault. There's no doubt about it. But he persevered and he understood that God was the true king of his life. That brings us to our fourth point, faithful following of God's commands. Hebrews 11:28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Moses personally kept the Passover commands. He corporately kept those commands, leading those commands to his people. And there were life-preserving elements of the commands that we can see. So much could be said about the Passover. So much could be said. The parallel between the Passover and Jesus' death is a whole sermon in and of itself. But what we see is that Moses received very specific instructions in Exodus 12, 3 through 4. Most of you likely recall the various plagues that God had brought down at this point on Egypt through Moses' leaderships. leadership, the culmination being the angel of death that would pass over the Israelites so long as they followed the commands God had given for the Passover ceremony. Moses did not just keep these commands personally, but corporately as well, instructing the people so that they too may have life. And there's a powerful reminder here that there's a right side and a wrong side to be on when it comes to faith. Who and what we put our faith in matters. Moses didn't say putting blood on the doorways of the home was optional and not to worry, God is a God of grace. He'll save you regardless of your obedience. No. He instructed the people in life and death Using the words of God himself, God said, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And, I, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Ooh, that's a tough pill for a culture that denies absolutes to hear. I mean, faith is alienating. Truth is absolute. Paul in Philippians 12, 2 reminds us to work out our faith and salvation with fear and trembling meaning don't take lightly the ideas of faith and salvation. Don't take them lightly. Just as Moses discharged 
the life-preserving elements of his faith, so must we as a church and the body of Christ remind our friends and our families that what we believe and what we put our faith in matters. When it comes to eternity, we have to make this a priority. Who and what we place our faith in, the object of our faith, is our victory. Don't take that lightly. Don't be tempted to water that down in relativistic theology or philosophy. In fact, Isaiah 45, 19 says, I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. And Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That finally brings us to our last point in the passage, and that's the faithful deliverance of Moses and the Israelites. Hebrews 11.29 said, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Faith made visible in the miraculous. Faith is not murky or unclear, and faith overcomes. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea. Pause for a second. Say that with me. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. They passed through the Red Sea. We read that enough times to sort of think it's like, you know, Santa landing a sleigh safely on the roof of a house. You know, it's, this is the truth, people. The people passed through the Red Sea. God brought the Israelites to a place where they would never be able to save themselves. Never. It was a dead end. In fact, that was God's strategy. It's pretty funny. If you read Exodus 14, God tells Moses where the Israelites are to camp after the final plague has been delivered. And he says, tell the Israelites to encamp by the sea. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. It's quite a military strategy, isn't it? So he puts the Israelites in a place of total vulnerability. Total vulnerability. And as I say that, I can't help but think how many of you here find your faith totally vulnerable this morning? How many are listening to me and just completely on the verge of walking away from the whole thing? You might be sitting there thinking, Brandon, you have no idea the course my life has run. You have no idea how far God is for me right now. You have no idea the pain I'm feeling. And I don't. I have to preach this to my own heart as well. But I do stand here this morning and I encourage you, I encourage you in the promises of God and Scripture that He will provide a way. Later in Hebrews, in chapter 13, we're reminded by the author some words from God Himself. It says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Can I encourage you this morning that God provides a way out? Can I tell you that when we're at the end of ourselves, God is there and wants to step in. We fight hard to make God be who we want him to be. We need to let God be who he's going to be in our lives and trust him. The next words we read in the passage, as on dry land, this is elaborated in Exodus 14, 29, where it says, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And so the way I read this is when you're walking with God, there's no way to turn right or left, and the ground you're walking on won't be muddy. Most of the time, though, life is muddy, isn't it? It's murky. But if you think about it, it's not because of God. Most of the time, it's because of the choices we've made apart from God. But I understand as well that the Christian walk is not always this clear. I know for many of you, you're here today, you're in the midst of a step of faith and you're not walking through a miraculous situation like we're reading here. The Israelites were walking in faith. They had no idea how the situation was going to turn out. So don't miss the point here and don't miss my heart. God calls us to places of uncertainty and we are to act in faith, trust, and obedience. When we are with God in those places, the lessons we learn from Scripture and of these great men and women in Hebrews 11, is that we're already victorious. We're already victorious because in faith, we live with this eternal perspective that the moment we choose to follow Jesus, eternity begins with him. So regardless of what the world does to us, eternity begins with him. 
My dad, who may be watching right now, good morning, dad, has always said you will know you are in God's will because it's where you and him are together. Let me say it again, if I can. You will know you are in God's will because it's simply where you and him are together. I think that's a pretty direct quote from him. Are you together with God? Is your faith wavering and murky because you're trying to find answers apart from his revealed nature and his character through scripture and prayer? Where you and him are together, there is clarity. We derive peace in that relationship. It never means we're going to have all the answers. It doesn't. It doesn't mean we're going to have the answers to questions of faith and all the other things. But we can take peace in knowing God is in control and that those answers will be revealed to us in his timing. 1 Corinthians 2.5 says, Your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. The culminating line of verse 29, the resounding defeat of the Israelite foes. When the Egyptians tried to follow on the same dry land, they were drowned. We understand that God gives victory. Sometimes we see this clearly as we overcome certain patterns in our lives for good. Sometimes we see it as we literally battle our selfish desires on a daily basis. But God's a God of mystery. He's a God of miracles. He's a victorious God. And we can trust him to lead us through the battles in our lives. Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite verses, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's not on us, fortunately. It's not on us. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. What a relief. And so I have some ending thoughts I just want to share with you. I, I want to close with the quote I started at the very beginning. There are many ways of looking at Jesus. Good man, historical character, interesting teacher, one who sees, one who hears, one who uh, loves. At any point, we could walk away feeling like we've seen everything we need to see, when in fact, we, have seen, we may have seen very little. The risk of looking again may well change everything. Moving to Connecticut, one of the more simple challenges my wife and I dealt with, and this was a great analogy, I have to credit to her, so thank you, Jenny, um, was getting on Route 95 here in Connecticut and feeling like we needed to go east or west. And those of you who have been in Connecticut know this. When you look at the map, you see that's east and west. That does not look like north and south, right? It was confusing to us. We just moved out here from Colorado. It didn't make sense, and it took several references to a larger East Coast atlas to actually see Connecticut was like the only state where 95 does not look north-south. But when we relook, it's very clearly north-south, right? But we needed a different perspective. We needed to relook, and relooking changes everything. There's comfort in the familiar in thinking that we have it all figured out. The author of Hebrews is telling the early church, you don't have it figured out. You don't have it figured out. Don't worship your icons. Join your icons in the substance of their faith, Jesus. All five points in the passage today point us right back to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the faithful example of a loving parent. Jesus is the faithful example of obedient choices. Jesus is the faithful example of living with an eternal future perspective. Jesus is that faithful, sacrificial lamb. Jesus is the faithful and mighty deliverer. He endured the cross for the joy set before him. Jesus, not Moses, is to be our exemplary model of walking with God, dependence on God. If the Bible says Jesus had to depend on the Father, how much more so do we? John 5:19. 1 Corinthians 10:3 Paul encouraging the church in Corinthus Corinth he reminds them that the Israelites he reminds them that the Israelites during the time of Moses that they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ in other words the Israelites traveling with Moses didn't know but Jesus was with them all along what they thought was water from a rock in the desert was a metaphor for the life-giving needs we have for Jesus. The author of Hebrews is saying, we know this now, we have this, we have the Testaments, we've seen Jesus, we know he resurrected, we have this picture painted for us now. All this stuff 
makes sense. It's fulfilled in Jesus. Don't get stuck on your icons. We're a self-involved, achievement-obsessed culture. We have to stop and relook at Jesus. Sometimes we have to relook daily, sometimes multiple times in a day. Mike Iaconelli, in his book, Dangerous Wonder, asks these very tough questions. How did we end up so comfortable with God? How did our awe of God get reduced to a lukewarm appreciation of God? How did God become a pal instead of a heart-stopping presence? How can we think of Jesus without remembering his ground-shaking, thunder-crashing, stormy exit on the cross? Why aren't we continually catching our breath and saying, this is no ordinary God. This is no ordinary God. If you're here this morning and you want to take another look at this Jesus, you're here because faith and everything else has failed you. You're trying to do it on your own. You're running ahead of God. You're back. Maybe it's against the Red Sea, just like Moses. And you can't tell if God is going to intervene. I just want to encourage you with some closing verses from Isaiah and from Paul. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It's easy to come to Old Testament verses sometimes and just think, oh, they were written for a specific person, a specific time. How does that apply to me? But Paul eliminates that by saying in Romans 15, 4, everything written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Everything written in the past was written to teach us. We're reminded God's presence in our lives and in our pain is very real. We're also reminded our faith isn't just a bunch of empty words, but the word of God is trustworthy, reliable, and holds us firm. It gives us that eternal perspective. Faith decisions are hard, but we win because Christ is one. That's the message of the gospel. We follow Christ through the hard times in our lives. Faith and obedience to the Father cost Jesus everything while he was on earth, everything, but he overcame. And to those who receive Jesus, who call on his name, he gives the right to be called sons of God. It's an exchange. It's my life for his life. My ideas of fame and fortune for his fame and his fortune. He promises hope, victory, and a place with him. We trust. We have faith. We're inspired by the faith stories in the Bible and in our own body of believers because when we see God act in other people's lives, we trust he's acting in ours. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word, which is instructional to our hearts and to our lives. Uh, Lord, we can't do this without you. We thank you for uh, this series. We thank you for faithful people like Moses um, who went before. We can study, we can see their faults and failures, failures, but we can also see, Lord, their victory. We know that victory is grounded in you. May that just apply to our lives this morning. Lord, thank you again for this time together. I just want to say in closing, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, I want to leave you with this. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. There is victory in Jesus Christ. Thanks. Have a good morning.